Tell me your name. I'm the motherfucking greatest. No. <laughs> My name is Daniel Begegaard. I'm a Danish triathlete living in Odense, Denmark. Uh, hello, Daniel. How's it going? Hey, Magnus. Good to see you. Uh, you too. Where's Magnus? <laughs> That's the question. That's what we are going to find out here, I think. Magnus Didlev is a mean son of a bitch. Daniel, he's more outspoken and like rockstar attitude. <laughs> he's one of the kindest guys you will find out there. But if you get the chance, he will rip your legs off. <laughs> I really see it as a healthy rivalry we have going on. His strengths and my strengths are quite different. I want to push those insane amount of watts you're putting out. You know, what you do in an hour, I cannot even do in 30 minutes. <laughs> I can say the same thing about you, the swim pace you can hold. We train a lot of our hours. The total time I've spent on Swift, it's uh, 35 days. That's a lot of Swifting. <laughs> if I'm not the guy who wins, I want Magnus to win. Of course, we are rivals when we head to the start line. But no doubt, I would rather see him win than some of the Norwegians or Germans. <laughs> I remember my childhood as being so pleasant and peaceful. Um, it could be like a fairy tale, to be honest. My mom um, brought me up by herself and made sure I had everything I needed in life in terms of uh, love and support. At seven he started as a competitor swimmer and uh, when he was nine years old he came to me and uh, asked if uh, he could swim nine times a week where three times was uh, 5 a.m. in the morning because he wanted to get better. The seed was planted back then that I wanted to be a professional sportsman. As a child, I was quite, uh, had a lot of energy. He did a lot of training, different sports. Football, badminton, handball, table tennis, tennis, swimming, biking and running. Someday I just decided to, <laughs> like to sign up for a triathlon uh, half distance and that was uh, not very successful but uh, something inside me told me it was fun. <laughs> so, so then things took off from there. When I first saw Magnus, he came in the swimming pool uh, and after thought, who the hell is he? He was like really, really skinny and he was not that uh, high as he is now. His potential was like enormous, so never judge a book by its cover. One week prior to my first professional event, I was riding my TT bike on a downhill and suddenly a car drove directly in front of me and I went uh, into the side of the car while still in the aero position and flew uh, over the car and landed on the other side of the car. I broke my collarbone and shoulder and the right arm. So I had to have uh, two surgeries done and they told me I wouldn't be able to raise my arm in the future. I was able to have like a big ball uh, leaning on with my arm and then I could still ride uh, on a stationary trainer. So for the next, I think I counted it to 125 days. I was sitting <laughs> in that very uncomfortable position, but I, that was the only thing I could do and I just tried to get the best out of the situation. And I think Actually, that's one of the reasons why I have quite a high level in, in biking is we could see the numbers in that period, they just uh, rose. I quite quickly, I started getting motivated by it, actually. It was quite astonishing to see how, how much better I got in that period. I started doing triathlon and I loved it. I moved from, uh, from Copenhagen to Odense, joining the, the triathlon squad. In my head, I was going to the Olympics and then all of a sudden I was not going to the Olympics. 
he was not picked for the last part of the Olympic qualifications uh, towards uh, Tokyo 2020. That was uh, like devastating to Daniel and, and he, lo he lost a lot of confidence uh, during that period. I was only going to Odense in order to go to the Olympics. Like nothing else mattered. I gained a lot of weight and I did not do that well at practice anymore. I was uh, sacked from national team. And that was like a kick to the face, to be honest. Because I thought like I was the new era of the national team. It was a very hard time for him because uh, he didn't feel that uh, anything worked. I think I had a year where, where I did not finish 80% of the races. Mentally, I was not really prepared for that. Living in a place where he knew no one, and um, oh, it's very difficult for me, this one. Um, can we take a break? I had three weeks uh, where I did not leave my room <laughs> and did not really pick up the phone. But I made a promise to myself at that point that no matter what, I will make a decision and I'll do it 100%. Uh, and I chose triathlon. Well, once I started uh, running and uh, swimming again after that half year, we were on a training camp. And we had to do an interval of a mountain and there my wheel slipped, so I crashed again. My legs started behaving really weird. Uh, and then for the next half a year, I wasn't able to activate my lower left leg at all. And then I just thought, well, <laughs> now I have to learn how to swim. So I started swimming a lot. When I crashed second time, I had just signed up for my, what should have been my first pro event again. And it felt like every time I tried to bounce back, uh, something new happened. And it was really difficult for me because I hadn't proven anything uh, outside like my own little uh, environment. So it was very hard to believe that actually I can be competitive. In order to be successful in sports, especially in a sport like triathlon and long distance triathlon, uh, you have to be mentally very, like you, you have to dig deep. And I think that's one of the things I'm very good at. I can dig very deep. Many of the top athletes have something inside them that just drives them forward. There is something inside them telling them to do this. You have to become the best. In 2019, I had a pretty epic week. I went to Finland and won my first race 70.3 there. The week after, I went to Austria and did a full distance and ended up winning as well. When I reached that final red carpet, I had not visualized how it would feel to win. It was like everything just hit me instantly. A lot of happiness. Uh, it was a lot of anger. You know, it was self-hate. That was the emotions that came out. I woke up the next day. I had messages on my phone and on Instagram about how arrogant and how much of a prick I was for kicking in the banner. I think Daniel just let his feelings free and to some it, it may have been too much, but it was just such a relief, so I totally understand the way Daniel reacted. You know, I had kind of flashbacks from, from stuff happening past years where things had been a struggle and all of a sudden I actually had one thing I could be proud of that showed that I had a place in the sport of triathlon. 
and it's very tough to just have a personal message from someone you haven't met or spoken to ever telling you that you are a terrible human being and disrespectful to the sport. People see one minute or two minutes of a whole life. And those two minutes, they just decide who you are. And they do not really think of the consequences uh, those kind of messages or comments have on other people's lives. I think if I grew up in a huge city, I wouldn't have uh, fell in love with the sport like I have. It's also a big part of why I'm doing it. It's actually really cool just to go for a run uh, on some of the local trails down the lake and hear all the different noises from just the nature and you are just out there alone. It's like you have a much clearer vision on what's going on. From an outside perspective it might look that triathlon is a really individual sport because when racing you are alone. But what I also enjoy about it is that it's actually uh, very social. The place I'm swifting is actually at my girlfriend's uh, apartment. They have a basement. Sometimes we're actually sitting four people swifting at the same time in the same room. My girlfriend is doing short course triathlon, so she's also a professional. And then her brother is doing middle distance triathlon like myself, and he's also a professional. In the winter time, it's very cold and dark in Denmark, so it's much more easy just to go in the basement and do a good workout. And it's just so much easier when you sit beside each other and know that, okay, I'm doing the hard work, but they are too. He's overtaking me right now. When you're swifting, you can see the numbers the other ones are putting out. And if I see that one of the others is, are not on point, I might joke about it and just, uh, hey, what, the, what are you doing? It brings the social element into something that is not really social. And that's a really big part of why I do triathlon. I love that part of Swift, the, the community around it. It's great and it's very easy just to make a group call and jump on Swift and have a chat, do some banter. Every time you ride one kilometer, you get a certain amount of points, and then you go to level two. Then it continues all the way up to level 50. I'm right now in level 49, so it's the last level, so I'm really wanting to <laughs> go to the level 50. I just unlocked the Tron bike. It's those small challenges that I really enjoy about Swift. When you've been Swifting during the whole winter and you go outside, it just feels as if you have another gear because you are used to pedaling all the time and suddenly, oh, there is a corner now, so I can't pedal. You can really push yourself on Swift because you don't get any breaks from it. To be honest, it's just a game changer. I would never be able to ride 20 hours a week if I didn't have Swift on the trainer. You can always find some motivation to jump on and uh, just do the work. There's so many factors coming into that. Like, it's not only... Everything ha can happen at races. And I think it will all... See, I I'm not sure if it's Yendelo that comes in now, but... <sighs> in Denmark, we have this unwritten uh, rule. Yendelo. 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 To me, it means... Uh... You have to be humble. Never tell anyone else about your ambitions. You should not think that you do a greater job than anybody else. It's basically the complete opposite of Christian Blumenfeld and San Long. It's quite in contrast to how professional athletes think, I believe. I could not go to practice here with my squad, with my own squad who knows me, and say like, I want to be world champion this summer, without people actually thinking like, ah, oh, he's, he, he's a bit of a dick. It's not because they are sore losers or terribly human beings or anything at all. It's only because they're brought up with the impression like he should not think that he's the slightest better than that I am. 
it actually got into my head quite a bit because you sort of think, is it true what they're saying? Should I just focus on studying or, or should I try to pursue my own dream? It's holding a lot of people down from achieving great things. And I think that's so sad to have a society like that. When you work hard for something, you put your mind to it, you put your effort to it, then you should also be proud of who you are and what you do. We both know that we would die in order to become world champions. I think Yander Law is something we're both kind of battling against. Because of course I have an ambition. I have an ambition about being the absolute greatest in the world. But I have to be careful who I tell it to. On the outside he has to, uh, to be a bit modest, but uh, towards himself he of course has to be confident and believe in himself. If Daniel keeps telling himself that he will never be the best in the world, I don't think he will ever be the best in the world. So, so he has to abandon the end alone. I'm not as outspoken as many of the other pros, but I feel like I'm improving all the time, so I don't feel that it's very unrealistic for me to become one of the best, if not the best in the world. And that's what, uh, <laughs> what's motivating me. If everything goes according to plan, I'm unbeatable. 2022 will show that we're not only doing the talking, because we are both very much capable of doing the walk as well.